And how much do I care about truth? In a past life, I think I preferred the sword. In others, it was the pen. And today, it's this computer. I want to say that every video I've made up to this point has simply been practice. I didn't want to start saying what I wanted to say until I had mastered this art. And although I have not mastered it, I'm satisfied. I've known what I wanted to talk about for over 15 years, and it was very dangerous. Even on this internet, speaking will get you silenced. Censorship is at an all-time high, and so is hypocrisy. It seems like the closer I am to the target, the more I'm attacked, both on this platform and in my personal affairs. I'm currently engaged in many battles with evil, and most of these will take place on paper. And I've made two videos already on the real subject that I want to talk about. And again, I have not felt safe enough to talk about it with this high level of censorship, pushing their false authority with lies and fear so that only their side is propped up. And just a taste of what's to come. As for today's video, we're going to check out a little town in Canada. Welcome. Okay. This was a share from Jeff, and I thank you, Jeff. Great clues pointing to a little city in Ontario. The city is called Gulf, Ontario. Very strange name. And here I happen to be looking at the Gulf power plant. So many different angles to approach today's research. I'm pretty much torn in many different directions. Here a college, here what seems like the remains of a star fort, and something glorious must have sat on this site. Let's zoom out a little and show you where we are. That was this point here in Toronto, and so much amazing remains to be found on these artificial coastlines. What was here before? And let's zoom out a little bit more. And here we can see Gulf, about a hundred miles or so northwest of Toronto. And who would think there would be anything out here? And yet there is so much. Seeming like an innocent little town, we see amazing canals cutting through it. We see a grid that looks like circuitry, now turned into neighborhoods. And even today, pretty small. And wait till you see the history of this town, nicknamed the Royal City. I thank you for being here today. We'll start off with a little history. Today, Gulf has a population of 131,000. A city in southwestern Ontario, Canada, known as the Royal City. It's roughly 28 kilometers east of Kitchener and 100 kilometers west of downtown Toronto. It began as a settlement established by a Scotsman, John Galt, a crusty old fellow. He was the first superintendent of the Canada Company. And like we discussed in a past video, these companies and their charters roll in and establish cities and governments, and in my opinion, repurpose everything from the old world. And if we were told the truth, and if the system was just and fair, this would be quite honorable. But unfortunately, establishing these nations as slave systems from the beginning. And let's just scroll down here and have a little look at the population real quick. 1841, we have about 1,200 people. And clear up to the early 1900s, not more than 10,000. And everything we'll be looking at today will be in this short 
50-year period, very much reminding me of San Francisco and even Salt Lake City, building out an entire city, in this case in a royal fashion, in 50 years. In 1882, they would open a public library with some assistance from Carnegie, of course. Always a good way to explain the impossible. Oh, a grant from Carnegie. Let's look at this 1882 public library. And I wish I could show you a picture of my shitty library. But here we go. And if you remember, in 1882, we should have a population of a little over 9,000 people. And this is their library. But that's nothing. Let's look at some of the historic sites. The streets of Gulf are lined with Victorian-era buildings, which are now well over a century old. Other historic buildings in the area include the Winter Fair Building, the County Jail, and Governor's Residence. The Gulf Armory, and let me just show you a picture of that. Here we go, the Gulf Armory. Armories are always constructed like castles, all built in this early time period. We see here a giant mill in 1855 and another one in 1832. But again, this is nothing. Before we go any further, I want to remind you of the Ontario Parliament building that we've looked at before. Absolutely mind-blowing castle. And my favorite part is this library right here. Everything coming out of this fragile and early time period, we're told, including this Royal Opera House. Very important to have an opera house like this for a city of 10,000 people in the 1800s, resembling the Crystal Palace design that we see everywhere. And because I'm impatient, I'm going to jump right to it. We're going to discuss this man, Joseph Connolly, an architect. He was an Irish Canadian, born in Ireland. He trained as an architect in Ireland before coming to North America. He is known single-handedly for the construction of the churches designed throughout Ontario. It's said in 1860, he went on tour through Europe, eventually started a practice in Dublin in 1871, and shortly after, as if travel is no problem, moves to Toronto, where he would eventually die. A pretty short life, about 65 years, but that didn't stop this man from working miracles. Let's look at just a few of his accomplishments. Here we have the St. John Evangelist Church in 1874. One year later, he completes the Church of the Immaculate Conception. One year later. So he must have started working on this one while construction was still going on with this evangelist church. But he must have been a very talented man. Because in the same year of 1875, he completed St. Patrick's Roman Catholic Church. So in about two years, he's banged out three cathedrals. But this man was very ambitious, taking on even more projects. In 1876, he completes St. Peter Church. All of these images on Wiki are poor. And just as a reminder, I use Wiki not to research our true history, but to mock it. This is the trusted source for the blind, and I take nothing on this site as truth. I only use it to show you how dumb they think we are. So from 1874 to 1876, we have four beautiful church cathedrals. And then finally, in 1877, he begins construction on the Basilica of Our Lady Immaculate. And let me remind you again, in 1876, we have a population of about 7,000 people. Why would 7,000 people find it necessary to be building all of these cathedrals in this early time period? If this story was true, this man 
would have been a national treasure. And as if this isn't enough, as if this isn't going to keep his hands full for at least 10 years, he begins construction on St. Joseph's Church, as seen here, in 1878. In 1879, why not? We're on a roll, a cathedral per year. We have the James Street Baptist Church. Boom. And while he's working on all of these, at some point he begins construction on the St. Peter's Basilica, another beautiful castle with Antiquitech, probably one to five million bricks per building. All at the same time, he now tackles St. Mary's Roman Catholic Church. As seen here, looks like a copper spire, complete with tech and rose windows. St. Mary's Pro-Cathedral in 1881. Remember, all of these are constructed by the same man, we are told. St. Mary's Pro-Cathedral, reserved for professionals, it must have been. And another St. Patrick's Church in 1882, looking like the Cream City Brick we recently examined in a past video. And just a monster rose window up here. He also designed the Georgetown, Ontario Church in 1885, the Holy Cross Church. Just a little guy. Must have been a weekend project. St. Basil's Church in Toronto, same guy, in 1886. Also in 1886, in Chatham, Ontario, we see the St. Joseph's Church. A couple domes on top of two spires. In 1889, we have St. Mary's Cathedral. And look at this, Kingston, Ontario. This is a side tangent, but I can't resist looking at their city hall, Kingston. So here, Kingston and today's city of exploration, Gulf, being called the Royal City. And mind you, we only have 6,000 people in this time period. And just kicking out cathedrals like they're track homes. 1889, St. Paul's. 1890, St. Michael's. Truly the world's most impressive resume. St. Paul's Church, 1890. Another St. John, a St. Gregory. And finally, in 1892, the Church of the Good Thief. What a perfect ending, complete with elevated terrace and stone wall. And I told this story to my mother this morning, and she's a builder. Her and her boyfriend have been in the construction business for the last 25 years. And though she typically doesn't agree with me, in this case she told me this is impossible. And I didn't even ask. And what do you think? Anyone. Is it possible for one man to be responsible for so much glory and magnificent deeds in this early time period? And frankly, I don't think they would even try this in America. This is one of the stupidest stories I've ever heard. And truly an insult to the Canadian people to be fed such lies. And here this comment was shared with me by a Canadian who lives not far from this town and it pleases me that one person at least does not accept this narrative and look how short this guy's entry is on this BS site and in one of these stories were told of his death he died after completing this one it said that he fell off a ladder before its completion of course and I think I'll just end there All I can do is talk. I have nothing else to do. Nobody to talk to. Sure, I could call somebody, but nobody really cares about the things I want to talk about. Except you all. So I'll share. Today was the day from hell. Recently I shared a day from hell with you all, and it was when the county threatened me in my house. And usually my biggest tests come from such so-called officials 
I did talk to somebody briefly today, my friend Bob, and I think we'll always be tested. I've been talking more and more about the oppression that faces all people, knowing very well that the more one talks, perhaps the more one will be tested. And I don't think we should boast, but I do enjoy sharing. I would never boast, but I am in a battle, as are we all spiritually and physically. And though I can't completely tell you about my experience, not quite yet, very soon I will be able to. I've talked on this channel about sending letters and being more engaged in the system, armed with knowledge and truth and God. But sometimes unplugging may require more extreme measures, and such extreme measures, or the first step towards them is what I took today. It reminded me of the movie The Matrix, how the character Neo could learn certain things up to a certain point. He may have grown enlightened, but yet was still plugged in to the system. And I believe in the movie it was almost some sort of surgical procedure, something in the back of his neck. But perhaps I understood it, at least in the way that it related to my life today. And it's something that I've thought about for years, maybe five years or more. And I also felt I was wasting my time. I should have taken action a long time ago. But I realized that I was taking action. The action was in my mind. I was preparing myself, learning, gathering more knowledge. Until finally, once again, in the mail, I received a letter. A very great and threatening letter. And where I was not sure when the time to act would be in my planning of five plus years, suddenly I knew it was time. It was absolutely time now. And I always find that interesting. We wonder if we'll know when the time is for whatever. And I think it takes an event for us to know when the time is right. And so I began the process. Again, similar to The Matrix, it was a strange process involving a strange man. And yet, I believe it was a process towards light and good. Again, even with the greatest knowledge in the world, you'll find yourself treading in darkness. And it's very difficult to apply the truth when you are participating in darkness. And many of us are born into such things. Many of us unknowingly finance all sorts of things that we wouldn't otherwise consent to. It happens when you buy a candy bar or a gallon of gas. A little portion is funneled away and spent by unsavory characters who don't have the people's best interest in mind. So I began the process and embarked with a organization, one run by a character I would attribute to Morpheus. Again, if we're talking about the Matrix. And I think about the position of evil. And how if they would have just left me alone, I wouldn't have acted. I wouldn't have been inspired to change my course. And when I change my course, I'll share it with everybody. And I don't think that will ultimately benefit them. And this makes me question whether evil is truly evil. Or a shade or part of God. Simply a tool. Because I can see how this evil has now prompted me to act and do what I believe is good for myself and all of the people. And this makes me question whether the evil is really evil or just a test, a trigger, to see if we'll do the right thing or if we'll continue to walk the path set out for all men, a trap in which we are taught is good and just and how did it feel to take this first step today? It felt wonderful, even though before I took that step I was in terror and felt there was almost no other option. Once I took action, I felt so good, and I can't wait to share this with all of you. I'm sick of it already. I think we all are. And be sure to check out my coffee on Amazon. I just went to Salt Lake City yesterday and picked up 200 freshly roasted pounds. Well, I guess that's enough ranting. 
I'm not sure where I can post this video, but I will leave a link in the description below. For today, I thank you for joining me, and do have a blessed day. Please like, comment, and subscribe.